Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about the descent into militarism in Japanese politics in the 1930s. How did they get there? Well, let's start off with the Great Depression, where we ended on class of the day. The Great Depression causes lots of problems. It exacerbates existing divides between wealthy Japanese and not so wealthy Japanese. But perhaps more than that, it creates this sense among certain Japanese constituencies that there's some sense of a moral decay in society. Now, it's not shocking they would think this. You have wealthy Japanese who are making lots of money while others struggle by speculating on the gold standard. And you did have a measurable rise in prostitution, or certainly a perceived rise in prostitution in Japanese cities. And prostitution in Japanese culture is a very complicated thing, uh, particularly in 20th century Japanese culture, because some of these constituencies are against all kinds of prostitution. And some of them are actually okay with prostitution if it's certain kinds of classes producing the women to be prostitutes. They're not terribly interested in all women being prostitutes or women that could be their daughters or daughters of people they know. There's also this issue with government policies that are designed to help the crisis but probably just make it worse, particularly prevaricating and going back and forth on the gold standard. And there's increased violence in various types of rural and urban disputes and worker disputes and so on. Things feel scary for Japanese and things are getting worse. There's also the continued importance of the military. Now, as we talked about before, the Japanese military is on a heck of a run, really. In 1895, they defeat the Chinese. In 1905, they defeat the Russians. In 1931, after the Manchurian incident, they go into Manchuria and establish Manchukuo in 1932. By 1937, I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit now, they will invade the rest of the Chinese mainland. For many Japanese, particularly at the moment of the Great Depression, and it's hitting its worst kind of low, um, looking back to 1905 is a sign of Japanese success and Japanese greatness. In various ways, a struggling economy makes people nervous, makes people worried. We're going through that right now. And it makes people question kind of what the country is doing. What is the country not doing right? What could the country be doing better? And the military, theoretically, had a pretty shining copybook. The military had a really strong record. This was very appealing to certain kinds of constituencies. And there's definitely an overlap here between Japanese men who have very serious concerns about the sexual health and behavior of young Japanese women and Japanese men who are really proud of their military. There's a certain kind of a conservative nexus point that's growing here. Also, by the way, overlapping with those groups, people with very strong feelings about loyalty to the emperor. Now, how do these constituencies, which are important and sizable and shouldn't be neglected, how do they become dominant? Well, there's kind of a rolling tide of uh, what is seen as government fecklessness and a lack of responsibility and everything else. And the army starts kind of doing its own thing. For example, the uh, decision to foray into Manchuria was one of these, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission type moments where members of the Kwangtung army and the Japanese military just, uh, just did it. They also assassinated the Manchurian warlord. And China at this particular moment has a very complex political situation dominated by specific individual figures we call warlords. The man running Manchuria was named Zhang Zuolin and the Japanese military assassinates him again without checking with Tokyo. And these kind of things are kind of filtering through and there's a sense that, well, the military is not really seeing itself as accountable to the government. Now, this is a real problem. The Japanese government wasn't necessarily established that way. The Taisho crisis of 1912-1913 had strengthened the state and had theoretically strengthened political controls over the military, but it was still kind of an open question. There's lots of problems and complexities over who's really in charge and can any of us tell the military what to do? It's, there's real problems there. Assassination of prominent political figures becomes almost common, sadly. There's a spate of assassinations in the early 1930s. Now, there's a little bit of continuity here. There'd famously been an attempt on Emperor Hirohito's life back in the early, uh, when he was crown prince back in 24. Um, but now you're starting to see them increase. And perhaps the most famous is the death of Inukai Tsuyoshi in 1932. Inukai had a long political history behind him. He had been a leader of the Seiyukai party and prime minister of the country. He was 76 when a bunch of young kind of military cadet style men broke into his home and murdered him. Um, at the subsequent trial, they used their time in the witness box to effectively stand up and make all kinds of passionate, extremely ultra-nationalistic statements about the need for the Japanese to be strong and to rise up and how the military could be a source for that. And the government was actually an obstacle to that. And they received rather worrying slaps on the wrists at best for the murder of this old man and established political figure. There was this sense the institutions were crumbling, were starting to fade into a kind of a military-led kind of a political scenario. And in fact, after the death of Inukai and after the trials are completed, you see 10 of the 15 cabinet spots for the government are now filled by serving military members. Remember that was a whole thing only a couple of classes ago, weeks ago in real time? 
this idea of, of changing the position of the cabinet member from a sitting military figure to a retired military figure. Well, now they are back to being active military members in the cabinet. And there's this sense that the military is just going to take control. And there's a chunk of Japanese society, whether or not it's the majority is a little bit difficult to ascertain. There's definitely a chunk of Japanese society who want that to happen. Remember, this is the 1930s. Fascism is on the rise globally. It's not yet the four letter word it is today, right? Um, Mussolini is admired by many. Hitler is admired by some. Remember, Hitler built the autobahns and had 0% unemployment. Um, he clearly didn't like Jews, but the extent of those issues come out later. Mussolini, similarly, perhaps people are either willfully overlooking some of the, uh, well, more murderous aspects of his regime, or simply just don't know about them yet. And so there's this kind of, there's this movement there in the 1930s towards letting the military take over and kind of direct a country in a strong, central way and everything else. And Japan, in many ways, is participating in that. The question whether or not this makes Japan fascist is a good one and a big one, and one we will come to later. Throughout the 1930s, we see an increasingly aggressive posture by the military, and particularly towards free speech and other elements of any kind of social behavior, really, um, that uh, doesn't fit with what they think is appropriate. Remember, many of these men now forming these kind of social policies as well as industrial policies and everything else are exactly the same kind of people only a couple of years earlier fretting and, and complaining about the Madangaru and all these kinds of problems, about young Japanese people drinking and being sexually active and having fun, that this was a sign the government was, you know, the, the, the society rather, was completely falling apart. Um, these guys are now in charge, and you see it in the colonies as well. You see it in Korea, and you see it in Taiwan. In Taiwan, where they had been fairly hands-off, really, until the 1930s, the Japanese language policy, where Taiwanese children were expected to learn Japanese, is ramped up. In Korea, Koreans are expected to take on Japanese names and register at Shinto shrines, at specifically Japanese-identified religious shrines in Korea. You start to see this development of the idea of the Koreans and the Taiwanese as true imperial subjects, though still not equal to Japanese subjects. There's a kind of a ramped up militant imperialism now taking hold. And finally, in 1938, you see the National Mobilization Law. Brought in under Prime Minister Konoe Fumimaro, the National Mobilization Law effectively puts Japan on a war footing, um, which is a response to the reality they've been waging war now for at least a year in mainland China and longer, really, across the region, and makes it clear that they're going to now kind of reach out across, you know, if not the Pacific just yet, certainly down towards Southeast Asia and take territories there. It also means the government can take direct control of factories, thus dissolving unions, and also the media, thus making censorship, taking censorship which had already existed as a thing and making it just the complete standard, which we're already seeing in our sources and we're going to see more of as the weeks come on now. This is what Japanese experience in wartime is like. You can kind of get with the program or you can have your voice silenced. In fact, society begins to become quite radically reorganized and there's certainly a very fascist style emphasis on a particular type of masculine, powerful, dominant kind of discourse that is expected to dominate society. Japanese racial policy becomes ever more kind of worrying from our 2020 perspective in the sense that there's this kind of blood purity seen in the Japanese man and the Japanese people are all monoracial and all these kinds of interesting and complex ideas. And there's more overlap, for example, with uh, European concepts of eugenics that we're seeing at this particular time than um, certainly Japanese conservatives in the decades after the war would like to admit or like to talk about. So this descent into militarism needs to be understood really primarily as the military successfully taking control of the organs of government and directing government and social ideas, policy, discourse and everything else into what the military wants it to be. So let me set up the discussion question very briefly. From the readings and from my brief video here, tell me why does the military succeed? What is appealing about it? And does it succeed, do you think, because there's just enough Japanese willing to go along? Or do they only need a certain amount to effectively impose things like censorship and social control and drive from there? And I won't include it in the discussion question just yet, but just think to yourself, can we see Japan as being fascist right now? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.